house foundations can generally be classified into two main categories shallow foundations and deep foundations shallow foundations are typically used when the soil near the surface has sufficient bearing capacity to support the structure they're cheaper and easier to build compared to deep foundations and these include the following types stiff and roughed or conventional roughed slab footing slab or basic slab on ground waffle pod slab stiffened slab with deep edge beam subfloor pad footings on the other hand, deep foundations are used when the soil near the surface is not suitable for supporting the structure. Common types of deep foundations for houses include board piers, screw piers, and basement walls. Let's have a quick look at each of these types of footings. The stiffened raft or conventional raft slab is widely used in Australia. This system consists of a grid of concrete beams with steel reinforcement that supports a concrete slab. Ground beams are placed around the perimeter of the house and internally at regular spacings. The slab is typically 100 mm thick, reinforced with steel mesh, and the ground beams 300 millimeters wide reinforced with trench mesh. That black plastic you've seen is the damp proof membrane or a vapor barrier depending on the location. And some builders like to place a 50 millimeters layer of bedding sand. To create this footing system, the entire area for this lab must be scraped and any grass and organic material should be removed. In this phase, generally a layer of around 100 millimeters is scraped, trenches are dug into the ground to form the grid shape, the damp proof membrane is laid on the ground, steel reinforcement is placed on top of bar chairs, and finally you can pour the concrete. Concrete is typically 20 MPA grade with slump of 100 millimeters and 20 millimeters maximum aggregate size. Some builders like to pour the edge beam first with a construction joint and then tie them into the slab in the second pour. Next we have a footing slab or basic slab on ground which is pretty much like a conventional rough slab with edge beams however without internal ground beams. The internal ground beams function is to make the whole footing system quite stiff to withstand soil movement from reactive clays. So the reason why you can omit the internal ground beams here is that this system is used only for class A and S sites where the foundation consists of sand, rock or slightly reactive clays. Hence, you don't need as much stiffness in the system to withstand soil movement. I personally have seen one or two sites like that on my projects and bear in mind that you might need thickenings for internal load bearing walls or bracing walls. Following that, we have the waffle pod slabs. This system consists of a grid of relatively narrow reinforced concrete beams that are formed entirely above the ground using styrofoam boxes as form work. The height of the boxes varies from 225 millimeters to 375 millimeters, depending on the soil reactivity of the site. The slab is generally 85 millimeters thick, reinforced with steel mesh. The internal ground beams are called ribs and they are generally 110 millimeters wide. The waffle pod footing system is cheaper if compared to the conventional raft slab because it has a reduced amount of concrete and steel and it requires little to no excavation because the slab sits above the ground. However, it's not suitable for every site and type of construction and the drainage system of the site must be extremely well done. Next on the list is a stiffened slab with deep edge beam, which is pretty much like a conventional raft slab with a deep edge beam, as the name suggests. Typically, this system is used in two situations. First one is on a cut and fill sloping site where we cut the soil from the high side and place it on the low side to form a flat surface for the house to sit on. The deep edge beam retains the fill under the slab and is generally constructed of reinforced concrete or mansory. The second situation is on a flat side where the floor height is above the ground level. This form of footing can be used on class M sites 
and AS2870 allows the internal beams and slab to be founded on controlled fill. So you don't have to excavate through the fill to support the internal beams. Even the edge beams can be sitting on controlled fill as long as it follows clause 6.4.4. Bear in mind that when I say controlled fill, we're talking about compaction that follows the standards. But you're going to notice that typically on cut and fill sites, they will cut away from the high side and fill the low side with the removed soil. But if the site material is unsuitable for use as fill, you will have to introduce piers which we will talk about in a second. Another important point to add is that the compaction of the fill behind the walls should be done carefully or the wall might be damaged. I will give you some insights here. If the fill depth is less than one meter, you should be able to achieve a moderate compaction for the first meter inside the perimeter wall. However, if the fill depth is over a meter, you should temporarily prop the walls and compact the soil properly. From personal experience, I don't see many builders doing that. So what I usually do is to let them carefully carry out a moderate compaction behind the walls. And I increase the thickness of the slab for the first 1.2 meters or so. Because this way, I know that a thicker slab can span the area where the compaction is not 100% well done. Next on the list is subfloor footing system, which is commonly used when the floor support structure is made of timber or even container houses like this one. These footings can be constructed using timber, steel or concrete stumps sitting on pad footings or board piers, which we're gonna talk about in the deep foundation sections. This system is suitable for steep sites and minimizes the need for extensive earthworks. A minimum clearance of 400 millimeters between finished ground level and bearer is necessary to allow adequate ventilation and termite inspection access. On a sloping site, the minimum clearance might be reduced to 150 millimeters. A termite cap is placed on top of the stumps to protect the structure from termite attacks. And you can tell by this photo that ongoing maintenance is essential for these type of structures, especially if using timber stumps. And lastly, we have the pad footing system, which involves concrete pads, typically with steel reinforcement used to support single columns instead of continuous walls. They're typically used in subfloor systems or in conjunction with other house footings, such as the conventional raft slab or waffle pod slabs. Moving to the deep foundation systems, our first contester is the board pier, which is created by drilling cylindrical holes into the ground with a drill rig. The drilling process involves gradually screwing the cutting blades into the soil, creating a bore or pile hole. As the blade advances, it removes the excavated soil from the hole and the process is repeated until the hole reaches the design depth. If required, a reinforcement cage is dropped into the borehole and filled with concrete. We use board piers in areas with difficult soil conditions or high structural loads. And they can be employed to support columns for subfloor system, as we discussed, or in conjunction with raft or waffle slabs. Next are the screw piles. Screw piles are widely used in domestic house construction. They're circular steel tubes with cutting blades at the base. The piles are screwed into the soil to the depth specified by the geotechnical engineer. Just like the board piers, screw piles are often used in combination with other foundation systems. They're suitable for a range of soil conditions and suitable for sites with shallow water table. And the last footing system that we're gonna talk about are the basement walls, which involve constructing deep walls that provide support for a structure above. These walls are supported by strip footings and must be designed to support the soil loads as well as the loads from the structure above. Basement walls can be utilized as habitable space and storage areas, and I would be careful when building them if the house is close to the boundary, as you can undermine the neighbor's footings. Basement walls can get very expensive due to the extra excavation, 
especially for the sites with shallow rock. So each type of foundation has its own advantages and disadvantages and the selection depends mainly on the soil conditions, structural requirements and site constraints. The questions to be asked before going into the design phase is, is it rock? Is it sand? Clay? Is it highly reactive clay? What type of structure are you designing? How heavy are the loads? Do you have high uplift forces? Does the site have access to machines like the like a drill rig? Is it a sloping block? Is there any sewer or storm water line running across the property? We look at all these aspects before deciding on the type of footing for each project. So in this video we looked into the various types of footings used today and their advantages, disadvantages, terminology and some construction aspects of each type of footing. Don't worry about their design for now because we're going to learn how to design, detail and draft in module 6 of this course where we're going to also look at a real-life geotechnical report and choose the appropriate footing for the house that we're going to design in this course. If you have any questions just drop a comment below and I'll see you in the next lesson.